Hello, this is the February 22nd Beehive Production user call. We have Chris, Jan, Patrick, John, Andrew, and myself. And there is huge news we'll get to in a minute that uh, Beehive for ARM64 has landed. But I brought this question up recently. I'm curious. I have my definition, but how do you define a production user? Who would like to start? John, you've got some thoughts. Or you just want to hear the. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll be Go happy to put the uh, the first uh, bullet Please. list I have out there, which is um, production users are the people that open tickets. And when you get a ticket, tickets have to be handled. Um, tickets don't get to be ignored. So when it's your buddy in the op next office over who says, "Hey, this doesn't work," it's like, "Hey, I got to deal with this ticket." So that that's production, and one is not. Interest. From my perspective, production is anybody who depends on it working. I mean, if you're, if if it doesn't cause you a serious problem for it being down, that's not production. Others, I'll throw my. Yeah, in I'll, I'll I'll second Andrew. Definitely, there are various degrees of how production something is. I run a couple of public services for my non-for-profit organization and stuff like that. And it doesn't really matter if the service is down for a day or two, but we would be really angry if I would lose the data or if we got hacked or whatever, right? So it's utterly important that I have a stable and secure environment, but availability is not so much an issue as it is at work. I'd still consider it production. I'll throw mine in text and then read it uh, if it breaks. So mine is you can be fired and or sued if it breaks and goes down. So related, but there are repercussions. A word I haven't used in this context. Re... <laughs> cool. Yeah. So you mean... It's the environment where you're supposed to have a separate test environment. There's that. Yeah, it's not a home lab for sure. Yeah, right. Everybody's got a test environment. Some people also have separate production. Yeah. Uh, Jan, do you have a your own working definition? <laughs> well... The simplest one would be uh, someone ye yells at you when it goes down. A bit like mine. Okay. <laughs> I, I, if it's only yelling, that's awesome. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you. Um, I Yeah. As this sort of formalizes as a notion, it's like, yeah, what 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 is the difference? And I personally am annoyed or inspired or something that there's a massive amount of YouTube content and otherwise and blogs and such that are highly popular yet, wow, not tied into uh, the firm realities of running anything in production. And it's awesome that you can build a cluster out of Raspberry Pis attached with USB drives and ButterFS and a this and a that and something, something, but it, it's like, that's great, but focus that energy please on the heavy lifting software underneath the hood because that benefits everyone ah, was that a rant i don't know so any other thoughts on that topic great so yeah uh andrew turner thank you uh andrew based his work on the work of say mihai karabash and company at upb and arm 64 beehive has landed in current um this was years in the making and thank you arm holdings for helping make that happen and the freebsd foundation and mark johnston who is just stunningly talented and is doing rod's work uh someone should make a simple wiki entry that hey beehive is available for multiple architectures and i've put in the uh, bulk of andrew's comment there I'm a little concerned that there's a hand wavy mention of a U-boot patch, and I didn't see anything in ports for changes relating to U-boot or anything vaguely like it, but that's okay. I'm sure that's all forthcoming. 
And my exciting news is that bless you, Colin. He's still he's he's honoring uh, the tradition of building weekly release engineering snapshots. And with this landing yesterday, this should be in today's snapshot. So there should be images. I believe you can throw on your. Uh, believe Raspberry Pi, if not, I grabbed from the Kern Conf the mention of process of CPUs and uh, there was one hard requirement for the GIC V3. Is there anyone who can enlighten the group as to what that is and what hardware includes it? That's the global interrupt controller and Version uh, two does not support uh, rerouting interrupts, which is required for um, virtualization. And I think that rules out most Raspberry Pis. And I'm not sure about the Raspberry Pi five, but I think three and four still have the old uh, interrupt controller, which means that you can't use hardware virtualization for interrupts, you may be able to work around that with emulation, but as far as I know, it's not universally supported, not even in QEMU. Can you think so, of hardware that definitely has it? Um, I think the old uh, Machito bin or something was often mentioned during the development of Beehive for ARM. You are correct. These days, it's a bit long in the tooth with its A72 cores. But, yeah. Welcome, Ararat. Um, oh. I would sincerely hope that that's running on, like, the Ampere, which is getting a whole lot of attention at the moment. Uh, that one definitely has a new interrupt controller, but uh, so much other things where <laughs> there may be new problems. Fair enough. Well, it's here and let's just all learn what we can. That is quite exciting. And I think I have the Machiato bin that specifically was supported by uh, Mihai and company, but is not supported by FreeBSD 14 and 15, or even maybe 13. So there's that. Uh, Let's just punch through these and then we can get to maybe our it has some questions. All righty, what do we have here? So this landed and I see that, oh, Mark and John are doing all sorts of debugging stuff, but add support for XML register definitions. Did anyone see this fly by? And it looks like ah, GDB following QEMU, do, 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 do. Any questions, any comments? There it is. Looks I like don't using any... XML to describe the bit fields in registers accessible to a GDB debugger cool. with a debug port. So yeah, it's probably useful for low-level kernel debugging, but not from users unless you have a bug in either your guest kernel or beehive to fight with. Beautiful. Well, there it is. I just did a quick look at the commits and well, there's a steady flow of things. Corbin's been busy, but it's dominated by Andrew's delightful drop of, yeah, so there was that. And we, on earlier calls long ago, we would pretty carefully go through reviews and commits and such, but then things got kind of slow and then things got on sort of a new awesome autopilot. So it might be time to revisit this view of the world, but I am so happy to see a widespread of people contributing to the hive. Uh, someone pointed out that long ago, Joint and company perhaps created a patent relating to Illumos and zones and I believe virtualization. And they're like, what the heck is this? And does it apply to us? If anyone has memory of this, go ahead and chime in. But uh, double hulled virtualization operations. Uh, and there's like, 
Max Bruning comes to mind and Brian Cantrell and such. And we have a bot. Oh, Patty. No, I'm good. No, thanks, Patty. Who, who are you? Whatever. Um, that said, I have no idea if this reads on open source hypervisors, but a colleague brought that up. So you are welcome to check that out if you are in the mood. I'll drop it in chat. Moving on, Chris, thank you for using the doc as requested. You are suggesting up a storm. So what you got? BMD, tell us more. Yes, yeah, so I was checking around uh, Beehive management, utilities, and software that are all running ports, and I kind of stumbled across that. I have to admit, I did not really try it, but I looked through the source code, and it looks to be quite... Um, Feature rich, let's say. Four days ago, okay. It does, definitely, it does definitely not address everything that we've been talking about so far, but there's a lot of stuff already in there, to be honest. So I was wondering if any one of you guys knew that already. Interesting. That's a new mm -hmm. one, and they've sure been kind of quiet about that. Yeah, that's what also I was thinking. That's uh, been quiet, like, a sub. How does this at a high level compare to your VM state D? Well, that's the thing. Um, I think it does a lot of stuff that VM state D definitely does not offer yet. On the other hand, I believe there is a couple things that this thing simply does not address, but I have to admit, I have not really compared features in detail yet. Great find, regardless. And they're documenting their work. <laughs> what a concept. And so I'd be one clear de delineation from the good old days in the modern era is the use of the internal configuration file. I see they've got their own syntax, CentOS guest and Bluetooth guest, auto inspection. Do, 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 do. I think it still is kind of close to UCL, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. They've been very busy. Okay. Development. And the thing is, it's really active, as you can tell. I mean, it left the middle two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Thank you, Yuri Chiro. We've got so, classics, Raw, Fiac, Lex, and C. Well, so, I was wondering maybe, you know, um, I was considering uh, trying to get a hold of this guy and invite him to the call to, you know, give us a demo, maybe. I would encourage that. If there's people interest, have been more responsive than ever recently. I don't know what's to thank for that, but yeah, do reach out. Excellent right, find. Well, and it's obviously active. Exactly. Awesome. And I hope it doesn't completely negate the work you've been doing so hard, but hey. No, 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 that's fine. And that's again, I mean, awesome. the stuff that I've been doing is, you know, trial and error just for me to learn. So I'm completely fine. If there is a better product and something that is further along, then by all means, uh, more power to that. Love it. Okay. Moving on. You have an observation about permissions out of the gate yes so there is vm run uh the shell shell, yes. uh, shell script at the base and at the moment it is actually i think 444 if i'm not mistaken so it, you always have to run it with sh manually basically you have to say you have to spell sh and then give the path to the script uh, we noticed that when I updated the uh, the handbook recently, and Broad also mentioned that it might actually be smart, you know, to uh, to remove the SH because it should run without SH. And then I checked the permissions and realized, well, it's 404. Um, I'm wondering what your take is in this round, what the right approach to this is, whether to keep it at 404 because it's not in a you know binary executable directory, so to speak. Um, or to change it and bring it to 755 or something similar 
And I was also checking other example directories. I, I The only example I found where it was actually executable under examples was in IP filter, MP filters. That was the only script I could find under examples in base that um, was actually 755. And so obviously there's like three options. Keep it at 444, leave it where it is and make it executable. Or maybe even another option would be to, you know, move it to, I don't know, uh, user SBIN or something. Question is whether we regard this as an example or as a kind of base tool. Yeah, and Jan makes a comment in chat that um, it is indeed an example. And mm -hmm. so let's talk about vmrun.sh. I don't think it's been brought up in the last, oh, how many years? Since 2018 of these calls, it's ever been discussed. I'll go first. Uh, one, it obviously depends on beehive load. And two, it is extremely free BSD oriented, despite the fact that it's easily hacked to support other, actually, no, it does have the UEFI that was added. Thank you, Peter. But it checks for a few free BSD isms and requires a few things to be dumbed down to support, say, Windows, which it'll do, but it just isn't geared to it. And one thing I've never liked about it is that a sophisticated, an adequately sophisticated use of VM run SH becomes just a beehive command with all the flags. So it's like, well, just run the command. It's, it's yes, helping. Mm -hmm. And it does have a, a simple loop to allow for reboot, et cetera, which is a, a nudge towards process supervision, but sort of, kind of. So mm -hmm. other, is anyone using it in production? I've used it just as like a super quick, you know, parlor trick that if you do a new installation, from, you can kick out to the shell, boot the installation under VM run SH, which is just elegant. But I don't know. Uh, should it get the love such as having uh, the, uh, uh, or what is it, slot 31 for Windows support on whichever device and little little things that I can, uh, I'll share my win VM run SHs if you want, but anyway, I'll shut up. Well, actually, uh, maybe just to jump in here really quickly, because to remind everything, uh, to, remind, to remind everyone in, in, in the group, this thing is featured quite prominently in the handbook. Interesting. And I think this is also... This is also kind of, you know, a question to me, you know, maybe we should actually take that out and instead just list the beehive executable statement that would, you know, do the same thing. Others. Have you ever used it? And heck, I even, I think I ported it to a Lumos just for kicks. <laughs> it's like, so I've I'll, I'll, used I'll, it. I'll, Go ahead, John. Yeah. So um, I've used it in the past, but uh, only to get me started until I understood the command line in better because uh, it is very limited in what it does. It's yes, it, it helps get to you to get your first Beehive VM running, and that's about it. Mm, so, so afterward, it becomes. Uh, annoying and it gets in the way of better deployments and i only used it because at the time there wasn't really documentation so i used it just as examples like Which, where it is that's, uh, that's the name on the tin it doesn't do proper uh, input validation and error handling for example at least when i used it it didn't and i don't think anyone would go back over such a script and add it all because that would make the script a lot harder to read, hack on, and uh, three times larger, probably. <laughs> so, yeah. John. So, it, it, it sounds like he was almost kind of headed in the same direction. Um, as a tool, it's a it's a it's a very individual tool and it, it does a couple things 
well. But we we were talking about production users earlier. And what does it take to maintain uh, a, a beehive or beehive VMs for production use? And, you know, obviously I'm biased. My perspective is, you know, I actually have to maintain a, a database and, you know, that database has to main, contain information about the, the VM. How do I, how do I hook up the networking? Is the networking a direct tap to a default bridge? Is it a, is it a tap to a bridge that's a lag with a VLAN? Um, is it a, is it an SRIOV or is it a pass-through device? Uh, there, there's, there's just, you know, do I have a single disk attached to it? Am I, am I running a system where I have, you know, 20, uh, drives attached to a, a, a VM that makes it look like it's a Hadoop node? Um, there, there's just, there's all kinds of stuff. And the one you guys have heard me talk about also is, you know, programmatical, uh, access or API access, and I, I use SOCAT, but, you know, I want to see what's on the console of the system. And um, I know that Jan and I have been back and forth on this a couple of times. I, I use Tmux where I can go grab the last, you know, 5,000 lines of the, of the serial console coming out of the VM so that I can programmatically make sure things are working or that nothing is going wrong. So it, it's, where on the on the scale of this is a learning tool and as Jan says when you need to bring up a quick and actually I think you said the same thing Michael if you just need to bring up a quick VM it's a it's a nice little tool it'll give you the default set of options you need you don't have to remember them it'll give you a command line and up 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 comes your VM but I don't view it as a production level tool but that's for my definition of production um and i everybody has different levels of production that they need to support um yeah. but i i don't know i don't know just thoughts all true my, my, my minimum Patrick. my minimum acceptable tooling for production use would be that if you power on the system so the the host operating system then by some framework, all your production VMs should start automatically with their defined parameters, whatever. As John said, networking, uh, disk images, etc. And when you shut down the host, there should be a clean shutdown performed on all the VMs, which is what TrueNAS does for me, which is why I use TrueNAS as, yep. as the UI for VMs, despite its uh, obvious deficiencies. <clears throat> So that's that. We have all of that in the base system for jail. So similar tooling like we have in, in the jail RC framework would be great for VMs. I've never used VM run, so I cannot judge if it's worth exploring turning this into a base system RC tooling. Hmm. And Jan, correct, you can run beehivejail.conf, but how are those docs coming? <laughs> okay. um, Patrick, Patrick brings up a very interesting please. point, and I've there have been discussions which go both ways. Does networking belong in the beehive arena, or should beehive simply consume the networking as set up by rc.com? I can um, I can answer that I can answer that for jails for our production environment with 100 hosts and 1,000 jails roughly. Uh, networking is pre-configured statically on the host level, all with Ansible and, and tooling and stuff. And uh, right. jails just consume the existing bridge interfaces that are pre-configured. And I do the same for TrueNAS with jails and VMs, and I encourage users on the TrueNAS forum to do the same. So statically pre-configure all your bridges, never rely on auto interface something, something specifically on the fly creation of bridges is so dangerous because you never know what the system is going to do. And then you end up with a networking loop. And uh, the default in FreeBSD for bridges is spanning tree off and down goes your network. We, we have a one time on the <clears throat> common support case. 
from my perspective, right. um, yeah. Andrew, go for it. You can having having to deal with 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 all of the networking stuff for it out, outside of my control plane for Beehive doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, a good chunk of that is because it's just you know the way the stuff is handled on the Lumo side of things. <clears throat> it, it becomes so easy because okay, we just make a virtual device that attaches to it, we're done. And the you know this this the standard zone style tooling for that it's built in, it does it automatically. So I mean that's probably the difference in my perspective. Can yeah, we just steal all that code? Um, Probably I'm comparing it more to, say, uh, VMware, which is now going away for us, at least for us non-paying customers to toy with. But in, in VMware ReSphere, you also configure all your vSwitches distributed or not statically up front and then connect the VM interfaces to them. So I'm just used to this kind of thinking and tooling. I'm, I'm not saying that dynamically creating whatever you need according to some policy wouldn't make more sense. I have never used a system that does it like this. Unfortunately, well, I mean, never, never used the Lumos. Well, I mean, uh, if you need, if you need, uh, you need, you have to specify, you know, what your VNIC is going to attach to. So if it's attaching to a, a physical NIC on the machine to talk to the outside world, you, you do have to specify that, of course. But if you just want an internal connection, that you have to predefine. So, but nine times out of ten, that's I'm I'm not looking for internal only connections. So, it's an option, but it's not one that I, that we have to use a lot. And of course, yeah. that option exists. It'll automatically, you know, if I set it up, it'll just automatically come up with the machine anyway. So I don't have to worry about anything special there. Yeah, the point is static bridging VLANs and so on works fine up to a point where it has to be so dynamic that you have to have some kind of dynamic overlay, which then you probably don't want to uh, redeploy everywhere so that every VX LAN or whatever overlay you're using is on every host. But at scale, you may have to do it dynamically. If you provision a guest, you make its network connection and the overlay available, put it in your routing protocol, and then you spin up the guest. Or you put in uh, the, you create the VM net interface, uh, and you wait for your routing daemon to pick up the new connected interface matching some glob, and then the route goes into your IGP or something. So it doesn't even have to be an overlay. Uh, but dynamically reconfiguring the physical NICs is the really dangerous part, uh, which you can easily get wrong and which will interrupt your network connectivity. So the problem is that all the addresses you configure on a bridge belong on the bridge, not on the member interfaces, because otherwise, as mentioned in these calls before, you break the IPv6 definition of what link scope is, which will explode in your face. Mm -hmm. uh, for IPv4, it's a bit more subtle, but it will explode in your face uh, eventually. Um, so uh, the, a lot of Beehive-related tooling hunts on this and either hope that your lab setup is only using IPv4 and not running long enough to run into the issues, or um, yeah, they just don't support this. So yeah, the problem we have is we don't have anything like um, crossbow in uh, Solaris. So you, we can't just assume that it's always configured in such a way that you can transparently add new virtual NICs and there's an implicit zero overhead bridge in between, which only is materialized as you add interfaces to it. We can't do that on FreeBSD in a way that just is transparent to the operator. So we 
kind of, in my opinion, the handbook should just instruct users to put, create a bridge, put your IP addresses on the bridge and reboot basically, and do that during initial setup of a, of a Beehive host so that you always have a bridge interface to attach to. Yep. And don't try to do it in hackish ways and especially don't try to have automatic learn the IP address is currently configured on the interface, dump the routing table and recreate the, the because just recreating the IP addresses is not enough because the moment you remove them, all the indirect routes uh, are removed from the routing table. So you would have to basically snapshot the routing table, uh, remove the IP addresses, create the bridge, assign the member interface to the bridge, and then, uh, restore the now basically patched routing table, which, yeah, good luck with that, especially when you have anything else dynamic going on, either dev D scripts or routing demons or whatever. Um, yeah, and we are actively thinking about refactoring our pro server product. And one, one issue we want to tackle is the size of the broadcast domains and the layer two bridging of the jails. So we are thinking mm -hmm. along the lines of still using bridging for VNet, but keeping the bridge that the jails connect to private to each host, so no physical interface in the bridge, and use the dynamic routing protocol to, to route the IP addresses of the jails with BGP or OSPF. Uh, why, doesn't really happen. Uh, why are you still uh, using bridging at all then and not just uh, configuring the jail hosts as routers and okay then... yeah sure i could use a transfer network on the e pair interface that that would be an alternative right um if you're in control because those are jails you don't even need that you can use an interface word okay. uh, as default route so that you don't lose the internal addressing and, okay. and because you won't have any alternative paths to consider you don't have to worry about being black holed by unnumbered tunnels or some stuff like this. Uh, so you could just uh, really assign each jail host a prefix, use the first IP for the host, and then you put uh, the e pairs in point to point mode by, by putting slash 31s on them or even slash 32s. And then you don't need an IP address as default favorite because you yeah, can use, we we, we specifically don't want to use a static prefix allocation per host because if we tackle this bridging mess, then we want VM mobility or jail okay. mobility across hosts. That's why we want to In use that case, routing to announce the IP address. But, uh, but, uh, but I get where you go. Do, so does this help with yeah. Beehive in any way? Can you do a static interface route for a tap interface instead of using bridging? You can do the following. If you create a VM net instead of a tap interface, uh, you get rid of the annoying behavior of tap interfaces because the moment a tap interface is closed, it goes administratively uh, down on the host, which will also drop the, uh, the route to the configured IP address. So if you use it as a host to guest connection without a bridge, uh, in between, uh, what happens is uh, it works the first time, then you restart the guest with the same top device, and then it doesn't work anymore because the route is already there, but the indirect route is dropped. So yeah, the fix for that is to use a VMnet interface that changes the behavior of the top drive. That's the only difference other than the name. Uh, if you create it as VMnet instead of top, then uh, it stays up. The routing table is not messed up uh, when the interface is uh, so you're, you're is closed. Device is correct. Uh, yes, because otherwise it flaps and is annoying. Uh, I don't want to uh, revoke the route from the IGP just before because a guest reboots. Uh, so, uh, code in FreeBSD. Yeah, yeah, it's I part of the it. behavior of the ton top driver and has been forever. Okay. Or at least going back a decade or more. Um, so, use it under the different name. It also has the nice side effect that it 
deconflicts the unit numbers from uh, everything else, if, uh, expecting to use a top interface like OpenVPN or something. Um, or other layer two VPN demons, whatever you're using. So that can also be useful. Um, for a bridge, it probably what you want, the behavior of a top device, if, but uh, for a routed, basically point-to-point -point interface, uh, you don't want this behavior. And then you can just do a route to it. Are you using so, a routing daemon? Uh, yes, but two. Which one? But two. With OSPF and yeah. Have you, have you documented that in any way, shape, or form? No, not for anyone but me. <laughs> you have a beverage of choice. <laughs> <laughs> Jaeger, I don't know. No, uh, Daniel, don't. you've been quiet. Any thoughts on Behave Networking and Sanity and Handbooks? I'm not uh, quiet. I was just freezing outside, oh, um, yeah. but I'm back. I'm back in now. Uh, no, not not too much. I just, uh, I mean, I definitely agree with not doing dynamic bridges. I don't. I, I found, I, I found myself causing causing myself a lot of problems with that though i have not been doing dynamic um uh well no this is more of a jail thing i guess i do dynamic sockets for beehive and i think that that's the way to go um rather than leave a bunch of taps around and stuff um or whatever netgraph sockets um because i i don't know when when for for the same purpose as mobility, like keeping keeping bridges the same, keeping bridges static between partner hosts seems to work well. And then keeping the actual interfaces of the of the VM dynamic, that that seems to make the most sense. Because I, I ended up actually creating so many MAC addresses and FreeBSD's basic way it it figures out MAC addresses cause conflicts all the time, which drives me crazy. Um, so anyway, that was that was some pressure to keep the number of interfaces, virtual interfaces relatively low on, or, you know, relatively obviously, we're still talking about dozens or hundreds of uh, instances sometimes, but um, yeah, still <clears throat> uh, nice to create those dynamically, I think. So old subject here, um, I've mentioned this before. I um, I have a large number of uh, Linux-based hypervisors that I am still using because I'm unable to replace them. And part of that reason is because I use SRIOV and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the SRIOV device is dynamically turned into a pass-through device i assign the mac address to it which would be the kind of like the equivalent of a of dev control on uh, freebsd but that process doesn't work on freebsd so anything i do on freebsd either doesn't get done or it has to be done statically so i actually have a lot of this working and running on on linux and i'm still hoping that we're going to get there with freebsd the flip side of this is um, we're a large VMware uh, house and whether you want to call it uh, uh, politics or you want to call it features, um, our networking team will dynamically add a, a VLAN to the port that the, the, the VMware system is sitting on and we dynamically go in there and uh, grab it and create a bridge off of it and uh, add that or create VMs off of it dynamically. And I'm in an, in an environment where I have to match the feature set that the current people are used to, if I can phrase it that way. So my perspective on some of this is uh, if, if I want this code to get used, 
I have to be able to exist in the same environment as the current uh, production process. Um, and I'm calling it a process because if we break the process, they're not going to use it. Um, anyway, sure. it's just a comment. Um, I, so I, I would say that, and I know some of you guys have, have, have been relatively strong worded on this, but given time, um, you can actually with FreeBSD, you can do dynamic networking. Um, and I mentioned earlier, you know, I, for Beehive, you need a, you need a database. And part of that database is the networking layer that the VMs depend on. Um, I can't afford to keep it static in an rc.com file. John, can you spell out exactly that Mac, a dynamic Mac allocation that works on Linux, but not FreeBSD? Um, actually, I think the answer is I'm happy to. Um, I can actually, I'll be more than happy to actually mail you some pieces about it. Um, we actually talked about this probably a year or probably, year but if there's a if there's a missing feature, spell it out just so we tangibly understand it and can you know. Yeah, so FreeBSD doesn't have the ability to take an SRIOV device and assign a MAC address to it. Interesting. And our my the systems I support the MAC address follows the VM. I do not dynamically assign MACs to VMs, um, except the very first time. And once we do, that VM will have that MAC forever and ever. Um, John, I have to uh, disagree. You can configure it via IOV CDL. The problem is doing that interrupts everything on the physical device because when you reconfigure uh, any virtual function, you have to configure the full device instead. So uh, I, that is I, what makes I, it unusable. I, I understand. And that as far as I'm concerned, that's broken as designed because it works. It, I, hate, I hate to say this because this gets said to me all the time. It worked correctly on Linux. And I've, I've yes. traced a little bit through their code. It's a There's elements of the driver that have to support some stuff that we don't currently support. The is there is a that, name for that feature that we're missing? Is it a a specific tangible feature in the driver? Well, it would be something like online reconfiguration. <clears throat> if you want to make it even buzzword heavier, call it zero downtime reconfiguration, whatever. Well, but but there is some tangible feature from a vendor that's implemented that we seem to be missing. Is there a Hang on, I'm, I'm going to try cool. to get you something right Thank now. Thank you. Perfect. Um, Love it. <clears throat> By the way, hey, John, do you happen to know how uh, these MAC address uh, assignments uh, interact with multicast MAC addresses? I don't assign multicast MAC addresses. Or multi, can you have in, on Linux multiple MAC addresses for one uh, virtual function? Or does, is, does it have to be a one-to-one -one mapping? I am using a one-to-one -one mapping. Would your problem be solved if you could only update the MAC address or would you have to be able to add or destroy a virtual function so that you can't pre-create the pass-through devices and on the then Linux, just update the MAC address? Them on demand on FreeBSD, I tried to pre-allocate, but it it's, uh, has proven to be almost basically impossible to track the IP address of the underlying SRIOV device once it's in pass-through mode. Um, of course you can. <laughs> With the database, that's what he's saying, right? Because you can't, once it's buried, it's buried. Basically, when you configure it as a pass-through device, you have no idea what the guest then does with the device. All you will know, we're just configuring the all zeros IP address on it.
I'm sorry. I'm not ignoring you guys. I'm looking up this piece. No, that's time. awesome. Thank you. No, and we're, 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 you guys, a I, lot going on here. <laughs> I'll I'll speak. I'll I'll speak up again once I I grab. Cool. This. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, Mr. Prolific Chris, um, that's a bit of a broad question about expectations for the handbook, and but it yeah. is a reasonable one. How do we go from a a sort of smoke test? And I was going to joke earlier that vmrun.sh could be like vmsmoketest.sh because it's it's an example and it it's handy in a few circumstances, but yeah, we really need some meaningful docs and meaningful tools and both have been limited. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning, I'm, I'm beginning to get to the point where I'm wondering, maybe we need something like, uh, we, we have a Porter's handbook. We have, we have a, a, a developer's handbook. Maybe we need a virtualization handbook because there is so much stuff that well, can be said about Beehive. But, um, you know, the handbook, if you try to put all that stuff that we are talking about in these regular calls, then I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be 500 pages, sort of, you know, in, in the handbook on Beehive, while the rest is on, uh, on, on all the other stuff. And I'm not really certain whether that is the audience that goes for the handbook, you know. Hmm. But... Maybe we need instead a new basically chapter to go before jails and beehive uh, for basically preparing the host network stack for uh, receiving VNet enabled jails and uh, beehive. Where you yeah, jails and beehive is prepare. exactly something that I also wanted to start writing about because that is completely lacking in the handbook at the moment. And what I meant is. Uh, and again, VNet I mean, enabled jails oh, yeah. present the same challenge as the hub devices for Beehive guests to the host network stack. That you have to have somewhere to put them or something to do with them. Either you have to have a routing setup and the host has to be a router or it has to be bridged. Uh, whereas alias based jails are just an alias IP. And inherit based uh, jails are just a no op, so that's fine too. That's a good point, and that follows the model you outlined, where all of the networking is set up, and you then just simply depend on it. Well, it, mentally, it's nice to set that up in a chapter and then depend on it in the later chapters. Just and out loud here. Now the. There are a bunch of features which are, in my opinion, underdocumented and utilized despite being documented. If you know where to look, and for example, that you can have multiple your rc.conf split up into multiple files, uh, and then, for example, for example, the networking stuff all allows you to basically aggregate all the networking stuff in there, and then you can use sysrc uh, to write it kind of like a local key value database. Mm. So that you can really use uh, union or uh, difference operations on sorted lists so that you can just append to stuff. It's still a bit clunky, but it can be treated and read back in as long as you keep it as a dumb a key value list in the files. The moment you uh, try to get too clever and put anything other than a variable assignment or a comment in there, you're uh, out of luck and sysrc can't help you when you have arbitrary set var in loops in your rc.conf because that is technically supported because your rc.conf is just a source shell script after all. I had to do this to create like 200 GIE tunnels because I didn't want to have a 500 line RC con. So instead it was like a 10 line loop to do it. Uh, but did, yeah. Did you just say what I think you said, which mm -hmm. is you can do various scripting within rc.conf and it will- Yes, and it is a horrible idea. Yeah, I, yeah that's why I'm like, that's my question. Yes, uh, the rc.conf oh. file is just a shell script. Yeah, it gets yeah. read with dot 
and then the path by the yeah. load VAR uh, function from RC dot oh So uh, you can put stuff in there with set VAR to assign variables in loops, or you can even put in eval if you're evil. Um, and you deserve whatever you get <laughs> out of it. Um, but uh, it used to be that sometimes this was kind of what you had to do, but now that we have something like SOSRC, you can instead, in a scripting uh, and tooling-friendly way, update the static file instead of having to put dynamic stuff into the file. Yes, Patrick, I know, but that eval is sometimes the only option. For example, if you want to read a variable by name from another variable. So if you want to have indirect variable access, the only way to do it is eval other variable equals backslash dollar dollar variable containing the name, so stuff like this. And yeah, there are places where you have to do that and it can be done in a safe way, even if it's here be dragons and it's like a bit of a high rope act, but yeah. So John, do we have the syntax under FreeBSD to perform that MAC address uh, there is no syntax. assignment, there is but it fails or there is no there syntax? Is, there is no syntax to do this under FreeBSD. This allows me what? to take an interface dollar i face, take the 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 v face uh, value uh, like v face zero one two three and set the mac to vf mac. So I can dynamically change the mac address of a virtual function interface. I cannot do this on FreeBSD. I have to destroy and recreate the entire set. And the interface is up and running, and it's a live MAC address change? I is do that... this prior to giving it to the VM. OK. But I'm just curious, like, what would happen if it's running? And good things, bad things? Um, it would probably get unhappy, but it could probably be done. OK. If I had a handler in the VM to handle it, I could probably, I could probably run it. So how deep have you looked at the code under the hood? Um, I've looked at it to the point where I recognize that I do not have the time to deal with it right at this point. But you see where something would go? Um, do you share what you've, what you've learned to date, even if you're not the one to implement? I can go chase up the email threads I've had about it. Oh, cool. Are they on just public lists or just internally? Um, a little above. Okay, well... Ah, I suspect there's value in that and with folks like uh, uh, Santiago doing quite a bit of SRIOV networking and having quite the adventures along with Anshinig. Uh yeah. yeah, that's it's important that this work better, dare I say. So, okay, and probably BSN, can you have multiple MAC addresses on Linux? I wonder so, if that gets cranky. Yes, Jan, you posted some code. Yeah, the problem is if you want to do something like that, you have to, as John said, reconfigure the whole interface and it just would basically disconnect every running Beehive user, uh, yeah. user of this virtual yeah. device from the network and there's no way to reconnect them without restarting them, which is totally unacceptable. Uh, and makes this uh, feature unusable. Yeah. Because, and so you have to reconfigure the physical interface com from scratch to update a virtual interface's MAC address. So in theory, there is a tool IOV CTL, but it cannot be used in this fashion. Hmm. Right now. So if it would allow just adding new virtual or removing. Also, what would be really nice if you could add and remove virtual interfaces and update the MAC address of existing ones without interrupting anything. The really most important feature for John's described deployment where the MAC address 
belongs to the virtual machine and not to the host is that to support this, it has to be possible to uh, um, to uh, change the MAC address of an existing virtual function without interrupting traffic flow, at least for anyone but this virtual device. All the other ones, and when still used, the physical one, have to keep on working. Okay, hey, uh, ring the bell. That sounds like a bug. Let's I, let's just at least document the heck out of it and get it on the uh, radar of the world. So yes, thank you. It is. Ah, uh, I'm not in front of a machine. I O V C T L. Thank you. There's no S or S. I O V. Yeah, I Great. Least, no. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, V F Mac not used. John, what's that? You got the. Um, I was just adding a little tidbit of of information here. Yeah, um, please. I so one of the things that happens is if you look at these network cards, most of them have a optimal number of SRIOV uh, devices that you can create, and then a maximal number. And I typically uh, will set them up to do the optimal number. And when they're created, you can come in and set the MAC address to be zeros or zero two. And then I can go out and list them and dynamically find an SRIOV device that is not in use. And then once I assign the address, it's it no longer has a marker on it and it's it's seen as in use. What would determine optimal? Like Document, performance document, degrade? Documentation from the vendor. Well, yeah, but performance degrades or stability goes away. What's optimal about it versus well, typically, maximum? Per, typically performance degrades. Okay. Thank so you. These, these, these devices basically have a built-in switch on yep. the card. Yep. And you'll find that many of these cards will do 8 to 16 uh, uh, virtual function devices. If you go over that, it will support it. But you will you will find that it is suboptimal. So, what I've found at least on older cards is that you have a limited number of interrupts and hardware receive and transmit rings. Yep. And when you Perfect. exceed the optimum, you can go down to a single uh, ring buffer per direction and an interrupt for maybe just one for the whole virtual function, maybe at least one per direction. But uh, at worst, you have one interrupt and one ring buffer per direction on the virtual function. And then you're trying to do 10 gig or more through uh, a single queue, which Got can it. only be efficiently processed by a single uh, interrupt thread, whether by a single virtual uh, CPU in the guest. And previously, you can do some nasty reconfiguration to, uh, to basically have the net ISR re, uh, shuffle the packets to different CPUs, but that's inefficient and doesn't solve the whole problem. I agree. So, um, yeah. You actually have to be There's really limit. careful. You can try to reconfigure it to make it better and you can actually make it worse. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So measure your workload, because if you are, for example, in a position where you can run jumbo frames, maybe three or four queues is all you need uh, to saturate the link. If you have to run a DNS server, good luck trying that with uh, one or two queues at speed. OK. Chris, you are on a documentation kick. Um, mm, uh, as an example, I'd say VM run sh needs maybe at most a text file adjacent to it in the examples directory. And like you said, it's well covered in the handbook. I should send you my win VM at run sh because, I mean, there's some super simple ch changes that make it work with, say, Linux and Windows. It's like because they're just checking for you know signatures on a disk image etc so yeah i mean honestly let's let's uh let's if you're okay with that let's let's uh let's go for a patch that puts that in 
in the wow. examples directory as well. Huh. Yeah, dude, you're you're doing you're you're exploring long overdue territory. Uh, I will skip the video, but yeah, you mentioned web interfaces, and I hope you're not going to mention BCV or CV thing, whatever, which is like proprietary <coughs> binaries on GitHub, which is not quite how GitHub was supposed to work. Okay, yep, two I, days ago, I, oh, I did mention video. and did mention them a year ago. So. They they have a really flashy corporate yeah. website. Okay, put it in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is this them with like? Binaries this this, this is GitHub? them, and we're with binary installation, and they it looks good. I will explore it because I just happened to inherit a couple of useless, in, in terms of not being used at the moment, uh, machines that I can yeah. put FreeBSD on. What I do not like about the product is that you, uh, why is it having hero here? I went to home. Okay, forget it. That, that's a flashy marketing site. What I do not like is you take a stock FreeBSD system, then you run some opaque shell scripts, and it turns your entire system into a yeah VMware clone, a, a BVCP host, and there is no documentation how you do uh, component-wise updates or anything. So they're not using the FreeBSD package system or anything. They just dump their software on top of your existing FreeBSD machine which can work for certain use cases, but it's not, of course not a maintainable software distribution model, in my opinion. So, um, a bit like CBSD, which is a lifestyle, and that's, I guess, great for some, but or the vendor that produces it and uses it. But for the rest of us, it's like, yeah, OK. Uh, we could spend the next hour of the call reading their license agreement. All oh, no, 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 that's all right. 60 pages of it <laughs> I here. Admit, I did check that. Oh, about three pages. Oh, my God. It's like. I yeah that that's cool, that's a business. I'm happy for them. Uh, for me, just for this the, this con in this context, it's a non-starter. Uh, so yeah. I will say yes. Yeah, absolutely. Very I, I, will, I will yes, definitely sir. give this. I will definitely give this a spin because I, as I said, I just inherited some hardware that I could use, and I'm always curious about this stuff. If this is really brilliantly good. As a user, we should probably talk to them about how they could open up a little bit more. And if they don't want to distribute source code, at least have a more standardized deployment process or anything and update yeah. process. It's either open or it isn't. There's not really yeah. a kind of middle magical ground there. I mean, yeah, yeah, of I don't course. Yeah. understand. You're correct I, with that. I literally don't understand. Um, I've been, I've, in case you're interested, I've been busy uh, adding to to Open Sense in, in the last two weeks, and we got cool. some nice extensions, and we will get an awesome new Caddy plugin. I hope in the standard distribution for reverse proxy jobs and stuff. Like that. so that's and, cool. cool. I look forward to that. And on this topic, I mean, I have people just saying, "Can we have simple webmin?" Just I know it's old, it's not exciting, but it's it's open, it's proven, it's permissively licensed, it's yeah. It's a thing. So if we have a Pearl junkie at the table, let's talk to them. Oh, let's run down your list, Chris. Uh, Windows detects virtualization. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, right. Chris. I just was wondering whether there's any kind of reference for that, because I was I was Googling around, but didn't find anything. Yeah, and related to that, I have, you, maybe you caught the conversations on uh, Windows data quiescing because it's simultaneously very well documented for like at a C level and then uh, C code and C sharp, but not in practice for an administrator. So that's a very good question and point. Uh, let's have that conversation uh, at, in due time because you are correct. Yeah. I will highlight anything actionable I'm making red here because you're onto some very good points. Well, I'm going to say something that I can't Please. back up completely Please. right now. Um, there's a whole Windows looks for a whole bunch of Hyper V uh, value settings to modify what it does. Yep. Um, it's been virtualized, and it's been a number of years since I was since I played with this, so my memory on it is basically zero. If I remember hey. correctly, the last time we were having some discussions about this, it was discussed that we think 
Windows does that not just on Hyper-V, it will identify a number of different hypervisors. It, it will, but for instance, uh, you can set the, those, those, hype, those values can be set with QEMU, for instance. So you can, uh, you can get Windows to do what you want it to. Absolutely, yeah. Which reminds me of the time counters work, which is pretty much stalled. It's like, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Chris, is that your review you've linked? Uh, yes, both of them. Actually, the, the, the man page is still open, if I remember correctly, and the handbook, uh, the initial... But the first iteration has kind of has, has finally landed, so there's an update. Okay. Uh, I'm working on the next iteration already. So. Okay, keep it coming, everyone. Please try to review that. I yeah, I yeah, I, I yeah, I would love to have that time, but right now my head is exploding. Um. Awesome. You've got your. John, we talking dramatic changes or not? Keep you know, keep them bite sized uh, uh, so that people can punch uh, through them pretty quickly. Exactly. So this one, this one is actually a suggestion to alter the structure of the man page because the uh, S flag is a uh, has has grown to you know F point point points uh, huge proportions. And the um, and the rendering is just basically that there is no there there is no more sections and, and headers that are kind of highlighted. So I suggest moving that into a separate section, yeah, and yeah. referencing that because that would open up you know to improve the man page overall at a later stage. So that's why I basically first suggest separating that, and I hope that this pushes through quite easily because it's really just not altering the contents, but really just altering the structure. I think this is also all long overdue, really. No, no question. <laughs> no question. Well, keep up that good work. Uh, if you've got something specific for the group to look at, let us know. Be noisy. And you've got a handbook review. Uh, that is awesome. It's actually committed. That's cool. I see. That one has already been compared, yeah. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. If no one said it to date. Uh, future state. Man, you're covering a lot of ground, but, and I'm so glad you're thinking yeah. about this. It's like, you think I've had the luxury of thinking of any of this from a high level? Yeah, no, it's always just sitting in the weeds. <laughs> Windows TPM, that came up. Uh, I've made a that, little note here. Should will thirteen three have the TPM uh, pass through? Um, if one of you Deutschlanders wants to reach out to Corbin, great. Otherwise, I've been chatting with him on another topic. I'll bring that up. That's pretty epic and a step in the right direction. And thank you, Goran, for porting the the payload for the emulation. But Corbin says he stalled on producing the use of that payload. So maybe I'll nudge Goran again because yeah, we need this and time is ticking. And if you know of any companies with huge budgets, just have a small developer slush fund, let's start slushing. Oh, state management. Yeah, well, you are describing everything this last year. Entrenig is kind of stalled on Super V, which is thank you, Jan, for your setting us in motion on run it and S6, but that's kind of stalled and it's driving me a little crazy. State network management, that's all the things. And at this point, we're looking at the little individual barnacles on the ship. Uh, let's jump to Patrick before we get to question mark, question mark, question. Uh, TPM passage. Yeah, that's a very good question. I need to, one of us needs to ask Corbin. I will try and reach out to him. Uh, recent discussion, virtual disk performance. Uh, yeah, that's. I think it's that the multi queue nature of that one, where there is a Clara article on. I think Jim Salter perform benchmarking different backing emulation models using Zvol. So, as for the why, my 
uh, from the hip answer is that it's a multi-queue support. But Dion, you can probably enlighten us there. I mean, because theoretically, BritIO should, for all applications, have the lowest overhead from host to the guest operating system. You said overhead, not performance. <laughs> a little bit of a puzzling result. Yeah, that's uh, it. Yeah, go ahead. The difference is that BitIO block, for example, has a fairly restrictive uh, interface. So it does, yeah, it's kind of dumped down view at block storage. Uh, whereas NVMe supports multiple queues so that you can throw more calls at it and operating systems may have better drivers for them, Windows. And so in yeah. addition, um, NV NVMe on almost every platform is, is already very hyper um, optimized because it's gotta be able to move data as fast as it can to these very high speed devices. So while there may be a little more overhead, it's probably not enough to overcome the multiple queues and whatnot. And NVMe isn't that burdened down with overhead compared to the O block because it's no longer doing cylinder head sector addressing uh, during early start of uh, serializing everything through, through a single queue and so on. It's kind of the idealized view at block storage exposed by SSDs or virtualized storage. So as a non-developer, I'm hearing that the number of monkeys on the number of typewriters uh, matters. It's it just matters. I'm getting shakes fine tuned. <laughs> it's yeah. fine. Uh, NVMe is a fine tuned oh. machine. But I, I've um, definitely seen better performance even on Rust. What I'm uh, doing is just use Vitaio SCSI for the flexibility uh, and performance is good enough for my SATA SSDs. So um, sure for high core count uh, virtual machines with uh, NVMe backing storage, I would probably run into bottlenecks in the power virtualized driver and its host implementation, but right now that's not a bottleneck I'm facing. Uh, and I value the opportunity to just hot plug devices and so on. Regarding that, has anyone looked into basically just pre-reserving a PCI ID for NVMe so that you could then attach and detach a file to an always existing NVMe device. So basically handle it as a resize to new size and then uh, something like that. So that wouldn't you wouldn't Beehive have to complain have... that it can't find the backing file? The, what I meant is that uh, it could just reopen the path uh, it could, uh, but that would be a bit problematic with uh, capsicum. So we'll have to keep a direct, the direct reopen and then reopen that or something. Mm. Uh, so that it could use then the file name in the direct way. Uh, or you would have to do it through a Unix socket to pass in the file descriptor, which would be the really flexible way to do it. But the whole IPC stuff has been blocked behind the snapshot feature because uh, uh, as far as I know, the uh, IPC socket was never moved out of uh, the whole uh, stalled out snapshot um, review process. Mm. Well, go ahead and smoke test that if you're in the mood and have the resources. <laughs> Um, I will just throw this out there because it was only yesterday that I proudly reformatted with NVMe control an NVMe device for a Windows hardware machine from 512 bytes to 4K native and confirmed that there are few benefits on Windows NTFS, although most other OSs and file systems on the planet will benefit. Wah, wah. Um, I have to actually go... Um... I'll talk to you guys all later. No worries. Hey, this is not um, a hard requirement. You're not being graded. Any and all participation is welcome, and thank you for your input. I'll just be a quiz later. Yes, sir. <laughs>
Cool. Or we'll just assign yeah. you stuff while you're gone. So, hey, man, <laughs> sorry, you're going to be porting out of the TPM. Yeah, emulation. Sorry. Anyway, thanks, Andrew. Uh, uh, briefly, Chris, what did you have in mind for question mark, question mark, question mark? As we're now talking well, about I think the high it's, leadership, it's an use. <laughs> it's an open-ended question, really, in terms of uh, and this kind of brings me back to this. I, I know I've been probably beating a dead horse here. I don't know <clears throat> what is called this, you know, a minimum viable product. What is it that uh, we as a group believe is worthwhile to rally the group and to rally the forces to, um, to keep pushing forward and, and and basically bring 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 the resources also on the foundation in if it is necessary. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, that is That's the sixty-four thousand question, dollar question, as they yeah. say. <laughs> um, can you compare? your tool to that one out of japan that is fascinating from one view on the subject mm -hmm. um i have not heard back from yakub about the middleware from the mm, shelved green as 10 project but mm -hmm. um a lot of things keep coming back to that. It's like, well, they had an enterprise-ish command line and a syntax and a middleware. He thinks the jet the GUI should be jettisoned, but that's okay. I personally advocated for them shipping a release with just a web shell and a, a enterprise-like mm -hmm. CLI, where it's a very different but I'd hopefully argue comfortable definition of enterprise software. It's like you hop into your Cisco switch and you start slamming commands into it. And yes, you have to learn those commands, but they're hopefully well thought out and you learn them once as opposed to, oh, the web GUI of the month is this and then it's this and then it's this and it pretends to be Beehive. It pretends to be um, Proxmox or it's a port of Proxmox or it's a clone of Proxmox. It's like, yeah, okay, that's a long slippery slope and we know, I mean, scroll down for that list of bullet points for the minimally viable product so that, you know, junior admin can check the state of a VM, start and stop it, maybe provision it. It sounds like networking is based on this conversation. Networking is still a whole can of worms. I know you don't just, you will not be reflecting every FreeBSD networking option in a, in a web GUI, given that we can't even document them, let alone understand the full extent of what VNet and, and all the goodies can do <laughs> and NetGraph and you name it. So, so if I, if I, if I read you, if you read, if I read you right, then basically uh, if we have the, if we, if we look at the different kinds of sets of people, you know, bringing in new people or working on functionality that is currently missing for people that are already using Beehive, then we would rather focus on bringing additional people to Beehive by lowering, let's say, the bar of entry. Is that is, is that what, what you're saying? Uh, what am I saying? I lower the educational entry level bar. The, the what level? Educational? Educational level bar. Is it is it educational? I, I, it's a good question, actually. Um, Documentation keeps coming up, and you're doing great work. You're actually probably doing the most active work on manual and handbook, and thank you for that, because everyone present on these calls learned something about their favorite tools of choice, like quite frequently, like uncomfortably frequently. It's like, what do you mean we can do that? Wow. <laughs> so docs, docs, docs. Um, and then things like, Bugs, bugs, bugs. If the AMD IOMMU is blowing up the SRIOV and we can't even attempt to do things like John, you're describing, those are low level bugs. This is, I'd argue, a slightly higher level bug. And identifying these issues has been several years of pulling teeth. And thank you, Jan, for enlightening us on proper bridge usage, which, gee, I wish I had been told that like 10 years ago. Thank you very much. It's 
documentation, documentation, documentation. I, I just keep coming back to that. And if someone comes in wide-eyed wanting to create like this nifty tool out of Japan we just saw, well, uh, they need a really clear set of APIs to to bang on. And the fact that the jail calls and Dontrenig produced a Lua-based front end simply because it's like, wait, jail is just a kernel API that we can talk to? Oh, okay. Let's have our students do that every uh, every September. So, so yeah. I don't know if I said a single thing that's actionable, but things like just documentation, more documentation, I'd argue is critical. Well, let's talk a little bit about actionable. I mean, I have a, I mean, I pay people in American dollars. If there were people that were like interested in helping administer and document Beehive, Jail, ZFS, and I could find a way to pay them American dollars and they didn't cost as much as I did, then I would, I would hire them. You know, I would, so I, I wonder if there's, so what I'm, what I'm getting at is I wonder if there's, I don't know if the free free BSD foundation, you know, has ways to connect people and create incubators. I mean, I've used the, uh, you know, the, the Michael Dexter networking system a couple of times, uh, quite successfully, but, uh, you know, I mean, if there, I mean, there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to do. And I think a lot of us are, you know, pretty, pretty high level. We have, you know, we have students and businesses to run and departments to run and billions of clients to deal with. Uh, but we have, you know, we do have exposure and vision and ideas and stuff like that. So, you know, the actual keying of the documentation in is something that a lot of us might not have time for, but would absolutely pay for. Um, you know, depending on the locality, and uh, you know, if I could, if I could get myself a nice intern, I mean, this is impossible for me to hire an intern that has interest in in Beehive. I, I don't even know how to begin to find somebody like that. But I would, you know, pay uh you know many hundreds of dollars a month to get some assistance and to get this documentation written so we could convert you know uh efficiently convert money into into documentation by attaching um you know people who are interested i i don't know how to find those people though um start you know, with the it's, ones it's... on the call and thank you chris don't get greedy based on what he said but you're doing great work and let's start with beverages headed your way that's fine i'm doing well those i mean all here and that's fine it wouldn't yeah it wouldn't be just documentation though right i would i would need somebody that could actively assist in the, the you know some of the projects that i want to do and of course i'm involved in beehive calls so it has to do with cloud efficiency it has to do uh, with storage um and it has to do with compliance. Those are those are things that I'm that I'm interested in. So I would look for somebody who's interested in those things, and also could develop their skills by writing Beehive documentation. I mean, I would be down in a New York minute, literally. <laughs> so anyway, I just think I, I mean I, I'm just I'm not talking about me really. I'm talking about sort of a broader point. Of where's the where's the incubator? What's the you know what's I mean we don't have a red hat. Uh, we have we have a couple corporations that are that are you know into helping us develop this stuff. But what about for us smaller guys? What about the smaller companies that uh, you know aren't making in the tens of millions? Like how can how can we pitch in? Because I have a little bit of I can help a little bit. This is the call on which we should outline the needs. And a lot of us talk in various ways in parallel, but uh, yeah, let's let's have that conversation. And uh, I'm surrounded by people looking for work, for lack of a better term. And I, in the past, I've connected dollars to work and uh 
let's build on the little success stories to date and have that conversation because it's like well we we're here because we're passionate and let's let's make it happen uh and yeah we're busy it's like john john dropped off yeah John, he doesn't have time to implement his lib NFS, but oh, wow, that would be useful where the virtual machine is its own NFS client and can't take down the whole host to just reset mm -hmm. something like he's discovering simple things like that. Um, Super. Uh, uh, let me default to thanking. Jan, you have, you've done some amazing things. I think we're all guilty of getting things to like 80% ready and never quite complete. Uh, let's keep maintaining that list here and now and just very live tracking it. And I'll say, Chris, I'm glad that the Enterprise Working Group emphasized the need for pro project management. That's awesome. But you've also learned in practice that Whoa, don't oh, clip the red wire there. and the blue wire yeah. or else things blow up. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really sensitive stuff we're working on. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, um, paying and yelling as motivators are tricky <laughs> with low-level kernel code and drivers and all that. So, yeah. Uh, Patrick, set us straight. <laughs> you can yeah, be the right. elder statesman here and now. Tell us what we have to do. What's this path? What's the shortest path forward for the maximum benefit based on your decade? Oh, to, to, to world domination for FreeBSD. No, sorry, no idea. Yeah, there. What's the? What does that look like? Because it's a, we're at such a crossroads with VMware going nuts. Uh, yeah, yeah. Any Linux fan person has probably not used it in production. So yeah, I I will take issue politely, selectively with that whole notion. And I mentioned the home labbers early who are dominating the conversation. That's not helpful. Um, so yeah. Uh, okay, team. Next step. Every day. We're all busy. We obviously can come up with one to two hours, one or one to three times a week to discuss. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the TrueNAS space. and uh, I appreciate that, actually. How, how yeah, the next can... version develops and uh, keep contact with Greg and, and Ed and about a potential fork. But at the moment, we uh, we agreed that we would just let IX systems do their thing. They promised us a great new release in April. So let's see how that will look. And uh, yeah, thanks again for holding the event. I have to leave for dinner now. Okay, understood. Uh, Patrick, I do hope TrueNAS will allow one to specify any arbitrary path as a device for storage, NVMe or otherwise. Like, oh, okay. That it's will be it's another... like an afternoon of work. And so what I do is like data. Yeah, another pull request. Recovery okay, with just you point at the drives. There's nothing more to it. Yeah. Okay, we'll have a conversation. Thank you, Patrick. Bon appetit. Guten appetit. Yes. Thanks. Uh, are we back to Deutschlanders? No, we have Daniel. Uh, and my, and I'm a quarter German. Whatever, go figure. Um, Daniel, you're serious, right? Well, you're obviously pretty damn serious. You Zelta, heck, you you delivered Zelta. How's that release coming? Because you've done what a bunch of us have been failing to do, which is take a great idea that might be super bite sized and wrap it up and ship it, as opposed to just get a great little proof of concept and then get distracted by the next task or shiny proof of concept to build? Well, I mean, it's uh, it's officially BSD licensed. I, I did simplified BSD. Uh, so yeah, it's it's out there. Um, I haven't I haven't really started like marketing it or, or anything. I'm curious. I mean, I know I don't want to wait forever, but there's a couple of features that I I would like to you know, add on before some some killer features that I'd like to add on before I start pushing it and try to get on a podcast or something like that. But I but I did, you know, uh, offer an outline for a talk at BSD CAN. Um, one thing that is notable is for the next three months, I am I am down one chief operating officer because <laughs> she's on parental leave. Um, so yeah, so I'm in a I'm in a situation where 
you know, I have, uh, you know, I have a second, I have a second job for the next few months at least. And, you know, and I, I do have, I'm, I'm in a good, good, I'm in good shape, but I really do want to, you know, I, I do want to develop this. But one thing that I ran into is I wrote this thing and it's, it's good. I think that, you know, I think it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty solid replication tool with a, with a different enough value prop that I think that it could be very attractive from, you know, those home lab people to possibly being the basis of a, you know, of some sort of uh, system. And it's not because it's, you know, a code that I crapped out. It's because I have an idea of how that workflow should be. Um, now, the next step, of course, is to document it really, really well. And I started documenting. And then I realized I needed the glossary. And then I realized I needed the man page. And now I realize the man page is out of date. And then I got a suggestion uh, <laughs> from somebody who says, oh, well, we need these kind of options and not those kind of options. You're going to get overwhelmed. And he was absolutely right. The number of options is starting to get overwhelming. So I have cleanup and I have doc and I have a fleet to manage with it. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I am committed to continuing work on it, though I don't know if I can continue at this pace without uh, an apprentice or a documenter or, you know, a contractor to help me out. And I do have, I do have ZFS, Beehive, Dale, FreeBSD contractors, but they're heavy hitters. So I can't really use that money and time for documenting some code. It's just not, it's just not an affordable way to approach it. Um, so Is, yeah, it, everything comes down to money. <laughs> you know, everything comes it, down to how much time and money do I have? Okay. What is the secret to documenting without subject matter expertise? Uh, enlighten me. Explain it to me like I'm five. When Jan explains routing in virtualized environments, like you can aim those words at your healthily paid apprentice, but all they can do is regurgitate for the most part. And they can look at the other crappy available documentation and regurgitate that and then automate all that with chat GPT. It's like, well, <laughs> not sure that's progress. <laughs> I I don't I don't disagree. I I I think that there is, you know, there's there's sort of a there, there's a story there's a story aspect of good documentation. I think there is Amen. a you have a you have a machine. It's a laptop. It runs ZFS. It has some Beehive VMs. You have an external USB drive. Or, or an extra pool, and you want to get thing A to thing B, and then you want to know with insane certainty that your backups are cryptographically chained in a way that you know you can't ever lose them. That's a, that's a, that is a promise and a fact that we in this little room of, are we down to four? <laughs> of four people know with certainty in a way that many enterprises don't. Yeah, and that's something that that that's something that we can, uh, that's something that we can provide. But but of course, all of that stuff takes, you know, it it does take an expert to make that, and it doesn't necessarily so, take an expert to do every. They don't have to do the video editing. They don't have to do the, you know, the, uh, you know, code like like put back ticks around my code. Like somebody can help me with all of that, and then we can get this. We can get. You know, we can amplify. We can basically amplify. We can be have force multipliers to get our ideas into tools for everybody. I'm sorry, Jan. I cut you off for literally no reason. Sorry about that. Um, what I wanted to determine is that you kind of need a narrative in, within approachable documentation because otherwise it's just a lead wall and your eyes glaze over uh, while you're scrolling for a man page without your eyes ever resting on the information when it sports by. Right. It's not um, what does the you thing don't know do? What, to look for. what do I so, what do I need? Yeah, what do I need to do? What do I want good to do? Good documentation, you need someone yeah. with this uh, who can structure it in such a way and basically keep the flow, check the dependencies so that you're not 
disturbing the flow of someone learning. But yeah, you can't do that yet. So skip forward, skip backward, and so on. And the other thing is you need someone if you want to learn how to do stuff and feel comfortable with it and not uh, fall into the trap. Most of us who are self-taught in some way do f fall into that you uh, don't know what you don't know. So that you have, that a lot of people who are self-taught don't know where the gaps in the knowledge are and may right. do really stupid and dangerous things because there was no documentation telling them why it would be important, but that there are downsides to it, doing it this I've, way or that way. And I've tried, I've tried, I've lost, I've lost weeks May trying to attempting to make Linux jails, I think, I think probably eight eight to ten times, like lost solid weeks doing that because what? because I didn't know that there were limitations to the ABI. So I was like, oh well, I'm just going to do I'm I'm going to take this take this Linux jail. It's it's an appliance. It's Docker appliance. Why can't it be a jail? And I just lost <laughs> weeks. And why? Because because it's not really it's not really well communicated on the FreeBSD wiki or other places that they're they're missing abis where such a conversion is just not going to be possible for certain projects and you know who who are the who are the heroes they're going to write uh write documentation to prevent somebody from making the dumb zfs mistake or the dumb beehive but mistake or take the uh, the michael lucas books on uh BSD related topics. They're he so works good. at it and spends the time to have the breadth and depth of knowledge and then structures in such a way where you learn the things uh, up to a point so that you can apply it again. So Yeah, I, so, I remember I read his BSD BSD book late in my career. I already knew all about BSD, mm -hmm. but within the fourth or fifth page of the tutorial, it's this story of getting your laptop online and creating a failover lag between Wi-Fi and wired networks. Like oh, and that it's such is... a, it's such, what a, what a brilliant thing to do because it's something that nobody does. Nobody has that power and you've got this free mm -hmm. BSD laptop and you can do that. And it's something and that it's nobody else years. has. Yeah. I mean, of course, you can but do it. But you have properties. to be uh, careful to use the wireless uh, interfaces uh, MAC address for the lag because uh, the association with the uh, Wi-Fi is per MAC address. Otherwise, you need the four address instead of the three address uh, frame format. Well, yeah. I mean, of course, you're, you're correct. I'm commonly saying, supported. Yeah, I'm just saying that it like drops you into the fire in in, a, in an interesting way yeah. that really can help you connect with the material and, um, you know, and and help you mm -hmm. and help you learn. Um, yes. So I don't uh, know the point that I'm. I don't know the point that I was <laughs> was working on. So but, keeping uh, yeah. uh, most the inherently dry prose engaging enough to keep reading and keep learning is a skill, which is not yeah. uh, just about technical knowledge. It's about being able to express yourself. And that's something that few uh, programmers can do. And the other thing right. is it's time consuming and it to do. So you could be hacking on the next part of your project already. And there, for example, the, I don't remember his name, the OpenBSD project has someone who just barely goes, or used to at least, goes over the changes to main pages and just reads them for consistency. Mm, and yeah. these are the, th the skills where you need a technical editor and where organization used to pay people to do it, to yeah. write the documentation. Old HP, uh, um, lab equipment or something had great documentation it was but these days yeah nobody wants to pay for that does anyone and pay for that a... for open bsd or they just do it because they love it and they have high standards of documentation perhaps the highest uh, out there. And, hmm. yeah i mean i was looking at uh, i mean i look at the looking at the open source projects with incredible documentation i mean 
like I was looking through Meta's open source, which I didn't, I didn't realize that they were responsible for so many open source projects, but it's all glorious because it's their marketing department because they, <laughs> they know, that, they know they can do it. They, you know, and they, they tricked me in a few ways that I was like, Oh, this project looks like it could be really useful for me. Nope. It's actually just has gloriously beautiful documentation. It's a much more complicated piece of software than I need, but, um, but you get, but yeah, it, it does, it does take like, you know, t time, money and staff. It's hard to find in apprentices and hard to find in volunteers for sure. Because I mean, I could do that. I feel like I could do this. I feel like I could learn this skill and I could, I could do it. And I'm absolutely not the person for it because I have to run a dumb company. You got to pay the bills. And uh, Daniel, you kindly shared this tool and I'll, I put it in there and skipped right over it, but you found a nifty documentation tool that is on topic. So let's let her rip. I'll bring it down to where we were. Oh, that's actually, that's actually the meta tool that I was just talking about. It's, yeah. it's, it's so, really, it's, it's super beautiful and super flexible, but it's, clever it's, name basically, it's, it's a, yeah, it's as hard to, it's hard to operate as Hugo. So that's probably not a good choice for for something that people can submit to. So I think I'm down to Bookstack and and WikiJS as possibilities. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep experimenting, but if you can drop uh something like Markdown or ASCII doc into it, that's a good place to be for technical yeah. documentation. Book Bookstack, yeah, Bookstack does it and and WikiJS promises that it can do it. It's obviously gonna take more overhead than other things, but uh yeah, book bookstack also it's it's not quite arranged well for a documentation system. And I would also love to get upstream, but upstream document systems our media wiki and the freebsd wiki they're not really convenient like the freebsd wiki i click on the wrong place and i'm editing something that i meant to be reading you know like it's i mean it's you great that click. The, it, yeah the, it's great that the information well if i drag and drop it it happens it drives me crazy but i mean it's great that it's there and it's it's editable but um you know, I had to I ask a guy who asked who knew ask a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy to get access to the FreeBSD wiki. So there does need to be, I'll use the word incubator again, an incubator for documentation before it gets upstream, so that people can easily collaborate and dump their ideas in. Um, that, uh, as Michael said, is not a blog. <laughs> ah, where good documentation goes to die. Um. I will briefly throw in the whole everybody knows that factor where I was, I don't know if any of you know, I was scripting a bunch of Samba for an, like an Active Directory server for my paper for a certain conference. And only one out of countless references mentioned, gee, DNS and time synchronization. The two most important things in all things Samba and Active Directory. Well, only one doc touched on that and it's really important and it there's a double-edged sword of a experienced production user who's like oh well everyone knows that of course you set that up correctly and of course you know that that's really important to the task at hand versus well they happen to know that and they happen to be viscerally communicating it because they've had they have the pain of the trouble related to it so they lead with that so yeah and i mean FreeBSD is uh, challenged in that it is a clear, defined limit of a base OS and its base documentation, and then a can of worms that is ports. And then where does where do you draw the line on you know describing Beehive without twenty external dependencies, some of which may not even be in ports, and you bring them to the table, and it's a simple script that's really handy, and you just that's what your production thing looks like. And John's you know, nifty database. Uh, where do you draw those lines? Because you FreeBSD can often argue that's not my problem, which you know that that whole higher level stuff is not the OS's problem. Or if you're virtualizing Windows, it's like, well, where do you draw the line on what Windows little tricks and such that are helpful in that environment get talked about? Yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, 
let's uh, there's something we're on to something that is urgent and important and it's not purely any one tool so i don't know let's all chat as appropriate outside of this context because this this context alone limits the scope and that allows for certain productivity but at the same time it's like well so many things that are important to it are not our problem so i hope this rant has been helpful Yeah, it always helps. Definitely and I can't thank you three enough for the amazing work you're doing. You are producing code and keep it coming. And please, please, Jan, especially as you you come up with this nifty, say, routed virtualized environment, please document that in some form, be it a god awful stack of post-it notes or otherwise that can become something more formal. Don't laugh or shame. I prototyped me. it. It uh, worked, but I, again, I, I didn't put it in production because it had a bus factor of zero point nine. Hmm. Um, mm. So I tried it. It works. Uh, the problem is that yeah, to operate it, you have to understand dynamic routing and all the other things. So now try to find someone with um, experience in running um, IBGP, OSPF, uh, 3BSD jails, and CFS, and yeah. You get access Good to luck. people like Rod free of charge several times a week. You're welcome. Yeah. You know what I mean is if I ever want to hand this off to someone. That is the problem, and I'm sitting here <laughs> totally off topic looking at ERP solutions for an amazing little company that builds a big, expensive things, and I, the, I'm glad you mentioned bus factor. It's like, yeah, that is constantly an issue, and the solution is Microsoft solutions and nothing else. Well, no, no. <laughs> so, no, we're not going that route. So, yeah, there will always be a bus factor. How do we manage that insofar as that bus factor is, yeah, I set them up with ZFS and Beehive and we're running Windows VMs in practice, in production that they can literally count the money on. So they're kind of important. And so everyone in this call could help them out. And I've got some thoughts on what a network of providers could look like outside of that. Not that there's a financial, financially motivated operation in these calls, but it's just a need that's there that we have to meet. And we're obviously meeting it for ourselves and we're sharing our wisdom. So what the heck does that look like to deliver these valuable technologies, the trifecta of container jail zones and ZFS and Beehive that I think the th four of us agree are about as good as humanity's given us to date. So let's not keep them secrets. So, Yeah. Uh, and just don't say that's marketing and outreach. It is, but it isn't, but it is, but it isn't. <sighs> well, what's wrong with that? It's important, but I'm concerned yeah. by the home lab type crowd that mention a thing without a a notion of it, the production importance of certain things. I, I, I don't know. I'm trans the, These are formative things early thoughts, but they've been present, I think, among all of us. And it's like, okay, what what keeps this practical and pragmatic and actionable and not just a endless supply of science projects and itch scratching and toys? I don't know. And this mm. has been a heck of a conversation. And yes, it's recorded. I hope you're fine sharing it. I'm not, you know, uh, I'm pretty open and transparent on all this, arguably increasingly. Rephrase like, this Chris, whole damn industry has to change. But <laughs> there, I said it. <laughs> While we were talking, I've been hacking away at uh, how to design a good um, include directory macro for libuser. 
And I found out that it is possible to do all that I intend to offer without uh, accessing symbols which aren't part of the uh, exported stable ABI. Because the functionality I want exists. Uh, it's just, you have to know what it does. Uh, because if you point it directly at the normal add chunk API, you are replacing the rest of your current chunk. But there is an insert uh, chunk uh, function as well, which does exactly what I want. I can basically save the current parser state in inject a bunch of dynamically generated configuration in place of a macro in place so that uh, the current parser state is saved. Uh, and that's a, is intent. And if you find the right commit, it saves in the commit message that this is the intended use for it. So yay, it exists. Fantastic. Yeah, so I can really use FTS to rock a directory, find all directories ending in .d, uh, find a, and create a sub object for them in the configuration. And then I get something which looks like this. Let's see. Like like chatter. Yeah, cop da -da 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 and then for example, for anything, it, and then like this for each uh, dot .conf file found. And if instead it is, ends in dot .inc, it creates this. Straight in the dock, bro, straight in the dock. I'm just copying yeah, and pasting. Yeah, uh, it's just a uh, work in, uh, It's a good progress. work in progress. It's a beautiful uh, work The work nice thing is that, so I've written a, macro which is called set which is quite simple it just makes it possible to assign variables from a macro so that not just the application can pre-register variables but the configuration can change variables which yeah in my opinion should be there by default but still um and then i'm writing a cleaner way to rock the directory tree using fds instead of doing it with open d and because of functions myself uh, then I have to filter it. And now I have to decide if I want to support more than one level uh, of a directory so that I can just put something into the right place and it gets slotted in. So here the trick is that if you put a file with a .conf or .ucl suffix in a directory, it will get loaded into a an object under the name of the file without the suffix. So uh, if I have a file named foo.conf, I get an object named foo in the current place in the configuration containing the content of the file. And as you can see with the set macro invocations on top of that, um, what happens here is that um, I export a, a bunch of variables and then I slope it in and the important part is that now the file to be included, which can be a symlink to a shared configuration file, doesn't have to know the name of the object containing it, its content, so that you can have reusable configuration snippets, which vastly improves reconfiguration with tools like Ansible because you only have to template out the simple the reused configuration. And then to make use of it, you just zoom link to that file and it works. And you don't have to re-evaluate templates every time. So suddenly it, instead of evaluating complex templates, what you do is you create or remove a zoom link, which is so much faster and more reliable. It's elegant. And yeah, I, the, the thing is I probably have to have a array of basically variable names for things or an array of objects for the variables where so that I can basically change 
only get up to a certain depth variable names assigned, and then I can control which variable t captures what so that I don't overwrite it. Interesting. Because I right tried to now, sorry? No, I was just going to say, I tried to do some stuff with UCL, but uh, it was that the docs were pretty, pretty light. Um, well, then, you have the API documentation and beyond that you have the source code. Right, yeah. That's all you get. Uh, but it's preferable to implementing all of that yourself. It's a bit uh, picky and sometimes a bit too clever for you, its own good, the parser code. But hey, it's, it's there, it's something you can easily generate. It's something people can understand. And the important part is that I don't want people to have to know the deep insights to make use of it. You should be able to extend it cleanly, uh, but you shouldn't have to learn the implementation details of this macro to uh, make use of it. You just give it a directory and then it starts working. Yeah, our SPAMD is like a little bit, I mean, it's UCL, mm -hmm. right? And it, uh, so? they're, they're, our, our, our SPAMD, SPAMD it's, 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 yeah, our SPAMD is yeah. the example. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it's also a good ex example of what you can do. But the difference is that our SPAMD, they, you kind of know ahead of time which right. modules exist right. and it, but it's also a good example of how powerful this thing is because uh, you normally never have to change the example configuration, which of the default configuration, which makes it so easy to upgrade because you only override the keys you care about. So mm -hmm. to make good use of UCL, you need an extensible, basically read only configuration where you drop pieces in. And to be able to drop pieces in, you have to have the right includes in place. Without this include directory uh, macro, the problem is that um, there's a bug in libucl, which would make it slightly less annoying if it was fixed. But the base problem is you can't really um, abstract over the name of objects. So you can't have the snippet stuff and reusability because you always have to put the object creation somewhere and then you have to write out the name. Mm -hmm. So you end up with a structure which contains basically a something.conf which only uh, contains a name of the file, open uh, braces, include with a wildcard closing braces. And that's uh, there is no logic that's only yeah, boilerplate you have to repeat because you can't abstract over it with the existing include macro. Mm, especially not if you want to have multiple levels because you're, for each level right now you have to do it because the glob uh, is the normal glob POSIX function. So you can't do a star star to glob recursively into subdirect in, uh, in a variable depth. Yeah. Interesting. So um, well, what I want to do, because um, right now I have a working implementation of a include directory, but it uh, just defines an external symbol uh, in, which is intentionally not exported, but just has to be there in the library, which is not how you're supposed to do it. So um, instead now the idea is that I walk the directory tree, generate the borrowing boilerplate in memory, and then in, use the insert chunk function to insert this auto-generated chunk uh, into the parser so that I never have to materialize this borrowing repetitive structure, but instead I just walk the directory a tree. And yeah, that's uh, what I did while <laughs> listening to you guys. <laughs> and while you did that, I added more documentation rants here about the whole, you know, business continuity in Open, using open source products because hey 
I think we're onto a key issue that's just uh, terribly underrepresented and great work, Jan. How about we call it there and move on? And MK Docs. <laughs> uh, what is MK Docs? Oh, it's it's another MD, I think. Friendly. The website uh, loads for me. Yeah. Oh well. Well, they've got a couple of IPs, so maybe I just got unlucky. I'll try a different browser. So about that same okay. rant, Daniel and I, I had a bit of a rant about these markdown tools. They all are like permissively licensed and awesome until the moment they're useful and then they go proprietary and are available for a fee. It's like, that's not quite how we define open source. And thank you FreeBSD for documenting for decades that you can actually keep it open and do good stuff and there are benefits. But, but yeah. Yeah, that's why that's why that meta project looks interesting because it was absolutely free and hacked on by thousands. It just, you know, was it was unfortunately you've got to use Git, and if you have to use Git, then we're losing a lot of people from doc helping with documentation. Mm. It's, I mean, just like I, I've been using Git for, I mean, as an admin, not as a developer, but for years, and I still get ahead behind, blah blah. Um, it's it's not good for documentation collaboration, I don't think. Um, Thank you, everyone. I will keep saying that. Yes, Jan? Yeah. The problem is wikis aren't really designed for this workflow either because you want some kind of technical editor to go over your documentation. You don't want arbitrary users mm, try to improve the handbook for everyone without right. uh, any reviews. So, that's a like good, a that's, that's So a even a well-meaning, well-intentioned user could basically overfit the handbook to their use case. Uh, rip out pieces which I consider no longer useful or useless or just right. Uh, Tec yeah, technical editors. Who would do are, that are, kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, it's critical. You're right. A technical editor is definitely critical. Um, yeah, that's why we have a week, a separate one, and the handbook. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. I mean, look at look, even, even when we keep the editorial of the contents uh, aside, look at how the how the pages that are laid out sometimes on a wiki, you know, nobody is really moderating that and keeping that consistent. And that is why one page looks different to to each other. Yeah, right. That makes sense. Oh man, this is this is going to be harder than writing my code. <laughs> this figuring out how to document it and and it. Well, I mean, I guess this is why. Your docs yeah. are already better than most projects out there, so just just chill, man. Um, and <laughs> you know, you've got live feedback as you're developing it, so that's awesome. Yeah. It, I mean, had you disappeared into a vacuum for like three months and come back with something, I suspect the world would be like, well, yeah, but in practice, <laughs> this. So yeah, your right. approach has been um, great. Maybe annotate in your code where basically where documentation of this feature exists. Yeah, your site, for sure. So that you kind of keep yeah, but... refer back references so that if you, while you're hacking on something, you have a reminder that, oh yeah, there is this tutorial referencing this, something like that. Yeah, that definitely why I like Rust piece of the puzzle. Area. Rust is really good yeah. for that. Yeah, you have the code right in there. And, and with with the documentation, basically with the code. Why? Is it... Well, I went for max portability, so I get uh, uh, cups and strings. Uh, that's that's my uh, programming language for this. On that note. Seriously, great work, everyone. Like and subscribe.
like and subscribe. Like and subscribe, yeah. <laughs> All together now. <laughs> cool. I'm calling it. I have a lot to think about. I think we all do. This is mm. absolutely. We're at a crossroads. Let's make the most of it. All right. Well, I'll see you all on whichever uh, system we chat on. Amen. Thank you.